Not only westerly anomalies are forecast for the Kelvin Wave generation area, but yes, real west winds, a westerly wind burst, possibly, is coming our way. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, April 9th. Storm surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell, you get automatic notifications when the videos are posted. And you can also donate some money. Let me show you how. Here's last week's video. Down here, hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. If you don't like it, hit the thumbs down button. If you want to share with a friend, click right here. If you want to donate some money, the special thanks or super thanks right here, click it. You can donate a couple bucks. We're working on getting a new server. We're almost there. We're maybe a hundred or two hundred bucks shy of reaching our goal. That'll be used to help us uh, get a off a very old Windows XP machine and get onto a new machine for our buoy uh, data. And if there's something you don't understand, here's the comment section right down below the video right here. Write up a comment. I'll try to reply. And we try to do that pretty quickly. Uh, we get some pretty good conversations here. A lot of folks, you know, I, we're going through a lot of deep technical data here. So if you don't understand, don't feel bad. If you're thinking it, 10 other people are, write it up, ask your question, and I'll reply. And a quick shout out to those folks that have donated. Mike White, Hurlbert, 808, Kenny. Good to see you, my friend. We've been friends for like 50 years, and my friend's even donating to the server project, so it's really appreciated. Elliot Harris, again, Baja Bugs, thank you. A Pot for Pot, thank you. Ian Moore, Robert Saxton, all good contributions. They're helping us get to our goal. All right, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. We see remnants of a gale still producing eh, 15, 16 foot seas, something like that, in the Gulf of Alaska. And you see the leading edge of more energy actually hitting the North California coast. There's some swell in the water right now from an earlier iteration of this gale. We also see a little bit of energy off Kamchatka generating 23 foot seas, all aimed pretty well to the north and looking like no swell from that is going to be uh, moving towards Hawaii or the U.S. West Coast. Quick look at current surf conditions. We'll start up north, northern California, Point Reyes buoy number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy. And yes, there's actually some swell, hard to believe. Uh, this chart depicts all the energy in the water based on period. The highest period available, 33.3 seconds, which there is a tenth of a foot, believe it or not. But most energy is focused here in about the 15, 14, 13 second period range. This chart goes the whole way down to five second period. That's pretty much almost unrideable, just wind chop. Uh, but you put all this together, it's the area, uh, the energy under the curve here, that's your swell. Do some fancy math, primary swell six feet at 13 seconds from 293 degrees. That surf that's probably about eight feet, and that's maybe stretching a little bit, but uh, there are some waves, and any wave at this point is a good thing. And you can see just scrolling down here, this is the calculated surf height over the past couple of days. You see, boom, 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 here we go. Definitely increase in surf height. That's a good trend. We go down to Southern California, the northern end of Southern California, buoy 46053 East Santa Barbara buoy. Looking at all the energy, swell hasn't hit there, just a little bit of wind swell at about 8.3 seconds. Calculating that out, 1.9 feet at 8.1 seconds from 269 degrees. That's roughly surf height of about 1.5 feet. And looking down, you can see that's probably the smallest it's been or close to the smallest it's been but there really hadn't been much for the past couple of days high club wise we go down to the southern end of southern california point loma south buoy 191 again not a whole lot of energy present there putting it all together primary cell 1.7 feet at 8.6 seconds from 262 degrees that'd be served for about one and a half feet and that's about what it's been for days now 
Then we go to Hawaii. Unfortunately, the Waimea Bay buoy is down, but at least we have one nearshore buoy on the Hawaiian Islands on the north side, the uh, Hanalei buoy, number 202. Again, not a whole lot happening here, just basically wind swell. Putting it all together, 3.4 feet at 6.2 seconds from 71 degrees. That's surf height of about 2.1 feet. And looking at what's been going on, again, just bare minimal wind swell for the past few days. So where did the swell come from that is hitting Northern California right now? Well, a little gale developed over the Dateline region, uh, 06Z on Thursday, that'd be Wednesday night, pushing over the Dateline, moving into the Gulf on Friday with seas building to 23.6 feet. That's the highest seas over this whole domain. The plus sign is where they are located right there, smack in the middle of the fetch. And let's see, did it grow from there? Yes, it grew to 24.8 feet and 26. 5 feet on Friday afternoon, continuing into the evening, and then started fading from there. You can see the swell front right there. This is Sunday 6Z. Let's get to 18Z, the current. And there it is, just starting to hit the San Francisco Bay Area, and is expected to push south down to Central California, but probably for the most part be pretty shattered for Southern California. And then looking down south, there was a little bit of a fetch here in the far southeast Pacific on last Sunday. Kind of uh, glossed over it. One of the viewers mentioned it to me and go, hey, what about that? And you're right. I blew it. <laughs> anyway, it's not much, though. 23-foot seas. I think they might have got up to 24 feet on Saturday. Aim pretty well to the north. Small swell from that is pushing its way north towards Southern California as well. Looking at projected surf heights, we see swell building in Sunday afternoon and then continuing into Monday in the six to seven foot range and fading as we get later into Monday, falling down from there. This really, for the most part, is wind swell. We can look at this. So here is, this is the projected surf height. This is wind speeds and direction. And then here's the swell height and swell period. So you see swell height, 5 feet at 13 seconds. Well, let's get into Monday morning. About 4.6 feet at 13 seconds Monday morning, fading from there. You can see the wind swell popping up, 9 feet at 9 seconds, something like that. Big wind event, and then things settling down from there. For Santa Barbara, no real clear indication of any swell from the north getting in a little bit of that wind swell and then things dropping from there you can see was that 2.7 maybe three feet at 10 seconds something like that so pretty small surf pattern for santa barbara looking at san diego pretty much the same thing maybe a little bit tiny bit two foot surf yeah, a swell 1.3 feet at 16 seconds. So that's that southern hemi swell that we were talking about just a bit ago. It's supposed to be arriving on Monday. So uh, continuing into Tuesday and then slowly fading from there, getting overtaken by wind swell. And then for Oahu, well, a little spike of something, 7.6 feet. What is it? Six feet at 11 seconds. Yeah, some uh, north angled swell coming in. Not a whole lot, just basically wind swell and then down from there with trades pretty strong in the 20 knot range the whole way through. All right, so let's go moving forward. What's the forecast? We're going to start up at jet stream level. These winds up about uh, 30,000 feet. These winds help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet, just like right there. So the jet is currently pushing off Japan. Japan's right there. Aleutian Islands there. Uh, here's the California here, U.S. West Coast down into Baja. Jet pushing off Japan splitting before reaching the dateline most energy pushing up into the Bering Sea it's really the northern branch that helps you know drive the storm track falling through the Gulf of Alaska right now this trough helps create a counterclockwise flow aloft like an eddy, both in the upper levels of the atmosphere down and also down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds, as they get traction on the ocean surface, generate raw seas. Seas, as they move away, away from the fetch area, get groomed out, eventually turn into swell. Swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. So we have a little bit of a trough and some probably some low pressure here in the Gulf. We'll look in a minute. Then the jet pushes up into British Columbia. Uh, the jet going up like this or like here, that sets up a 
clockwise flow aloft into the ocean surface. That's high pressure, and that doesn't do a whole lot for generating any meaningful surf. Uh, what it does do relative to California, though, is give us some clear skies and finally some warming temperatures and things giving things a chance to dry out. All right, as we get into Monday, the trough in the Gulf pushes off to the east, gets pinched off. By Tuesday, it's in land over British Columbia, really doing nothing. Now, as we get into Thursday, notice the jet still split pretty weak, kind of weird looking, but it starts to sag over the Gulf of Alaska. And as we get into Friday, another trough forms. Now, notice not a whole lot of wind energy is forecast pushing into it. Yeah, maybe 130, 140 knot winds. So we get into Saturday, maybe that can support yet another low pressure system and some fetch and maybe some wind swell working its way into the California coast. And there we are 180 hours out pretty much the jet a mess other than this trough in the Gulf. Just persistent uh, troughing in the Gulf, persistent weather production. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit late in the year, and these troughs just don't get as much traction as they would if it was December or January. We're moving towards the change in season, and at some point, no matter how much troughing you have, you end up with not a really good, strong gale or not enough fetch to generate meaningful swell. So next we go down to the surface. Surface level pressure, surface level winds. Yeah, we do. We figured there was some sort of low here off Kamchatka. Generating 35 to 40 knot winds aimed north, not at any of our forecast area and of no particular interest. High pressure over the dateline and weak low pressure in the Gulf of Alaska generating 30 knot winds. As we continue into Monday, that system just completely collapses. The system off of Kamchatka, well, we think, there we go, it just sort of goes up to the north and fades out, and you end up with nothing. We think our only next hope is that next trough forecast for the Gulf of Alaska. Here we go as we get into Friday, 30 knot wind, 25 to 30 knot winds, we'll say. And we go into Saturday, yeah, maybe there's some hope there. Now, notice these winds, 35 knots, but they're all aimed off to the north up in the Bering Sea. Another low pushes off of uh, Japan. Now, also notice potential tropical system down here. We're going to get into this in a minute. Not that we believe that that will happen, but there's a whole good, interesting, educational and sort of a story about all this in a minute. And that also keys very much on the teaser that we put right up front in the video. Anyway, the Gulf, the gale in the Gulf, or not even gale, a low pressure in the Gulf, starts fading on Sunday. It's 20 to 25 knot winds. That's good for eight or nine second period wind swell, and that's about it. And there we go. What's the effect of those winds on the ocean surface? Well, we see, what is that, about 15 foot seas? Yeah, 15, maybe 16 feet in the Gulf of Alaska, and those seas quickly fading out. They'll be mixing with the swell that's already hitting, so there will be a bunch of say wind swell behind the main swell event but i suspect there's going to be some wind coming in with that as well as we continue on through the week we're looking for any seas greater than 20 feet here we go the next low setting up in the gulf on late friday into saturday those seas are 14 or 15 feet maybe not even 16 feet and that's into Sunday, and there we are a week out and nothing. So wind swell pushing down the coast. That's about it. Local wind forecast. So winds, uh, not even really trades, almost northeast winds for the Hawaiian Islands, 15 knots. Light wind regime for California today. So we get into Monday, a light northwesterly flow for north and central California. Southern California blocked by the Channel Islands and sort of behind the crook here. Wind, not nearly as much of a concern. You notice we focus on North and Central California, not because we don't love the folks in Southern California, but just that they just have so much better protection from winds as compared to exposed breaks up in North and Central California. It's a complete wind machine once you get north of Point Conception. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands, 15 to 20 knots, more out of the east. So we get into Tuesday, winds start building on North Central California. 20 knots. Uh, trade solid 20 plus knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Wednesday, wind machine starts building more for North and Central California. 20 to 25 knots. Trade solid for the Hawaiian Islands. 
Thursday, here we go, wind event, 30 knot, north winds from north and central California. It might be good for wind swell down into southern California. Trades back off a little bit for the Hawaiian Islands at 15 knots. Friday, the wind machine backs off some for north and central California at 15 to 20 knots. Trades out of the east, 15 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Saturday, finally, the wind machine breaks for California. Trades lighten up for the Hawaiian Islands at 10 or 15 knots. And on Sunday, relatively lighter winds for California. Uh, trades almost out of the southeast for the Hawaiian Islands. And you see low pressure and wind swell likely bound for the coast, the north and central coast after that. Precip forecast for California. California is right there. It finally looks like it's over after it's been a solid six weeks of nonstop rain and wind and snow for the Sierra. I mean, it's been great if you're into skiing and boarding. Um, certainly, there has not really been any surf. We've been on the road a lot just chasing snow. Uh, but that looks like it's over. You can see as we get into Monday, dry air. A little bit of a front trying to push through on Tuesday, making it down to a point raise and then quickly evaporating before even hardly sunrise on Tuesday. And then we get into Wednesday. Another front tries to make it just nothing, maybe showers for Cape Mendocino. And then pretty much a dead dry pattern after that. We're into Sunday, just no, whoops, nothing there. Uh, we're not even going to do, look at the uh, spot specific, specific snow forecast because there's literally no snow forecast for California. So the big dry out is finally starting to happen. All right, let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden-Julian Oscillation and the El Nino Southern Oscillation? These two oscillations are responsible for weather going, if you're looking out, a month to a year from now. So by long term, we're not just talking a week or two. We're talking long term outlook. And we're going to start by looking at winds in the West Pacific on the equator. We're talking about the Madden-Julian Oscillation. There's two phases, the active phase and the inactive phase. They rotate around the planet going west to east on the equator. The active phase on one side of the planet, the inactive phase on the other. They rotate around the planet. The inactive phase is effectively a high-pressure system, clouds-free skies. It enhances trade winds and uh, does not produce precipitation. The active phase is the one we're interested in, especially when it moves into the West Pacific, what we call the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. And we're going to get very specific about that in just a little bit. But what it does, it is a low-pressure system. It actually dampens trade winds. It also creates lots of clouds and rain and precipitation, but it's the dampening of the trade winds that really matter. What that does, that imparts energy or sucks warm, moist air down at the surface, high up in the atmosphere. That gets caught up in the jet stream. It energizes the jet stream over the North Pacific and the South Pacific, and that can really help feed storm development. It also, like I said earlier, can reduce trade winds or out and out reverse them. And when that happens, then all sorts of magic happens. Warm water that's in the West Pacific starts moving off to the east in what's known as a Kelvin wave, a ball of warm water, but it doesn't travel on the surface. It follows the thermocline under the equator and takes so oh, about uh, three months to make it from the West Pacific, eventually slamming into the Galapagos in Ecuador, where it erupts to the surface, creates a warm water slick there. Now, that in and of itself is interesting. But if you get multiple active phases of the MJO in close succession, they create multiple Kelvin waves that significantly warm the East Pacific, where typically the waters are very cold. Nutrient-rich rich upwelling normally happens there, so it sort of puts a kibosh on fishing and makes things not quite as uh, productive as they normally are. But what it also does is it rearranges the entire upper-level jet stream flow of the planet, and that really focuses storm energy in the North Pacific and the South Pacific in summer months, the year after El Nino. So we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MGO. We do that by looking for dampening of trade winds. All right, so 
with that said, we're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator. There's the equator, zero right there. This is the far, the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific there. There is uh, New Guinea. The date line is right there. And over here, well, Ecuador is a bit off the picture here, but close enough. We're just looking at the arrows. These are wind speeds, five-day average winds. You see winds pretty strong. The longer the arrow, pretty strong out of the east, but then kind of dead right in here, not blowing. And then moderately strong over the central Pacific and moderate to a little bit stronger over the dateline, which these sensors over here were working. We can't see that. We're kind of blind. But it's not the actual wind speeds that matter. It's really the difference from normal for this time of year. It's if they get lighter than normal for this time of year, that's when that Kelvin wave machine starts firing up. So like in the east Pacific, whoa, what's this? We see actual, the equivalent of the reversal of trade winds. This doesn't mean winds are actually blowing out of the west here, but what it does mean is that from a wind per historical perspective, their trades are effectively reversed here. Over the date line, they're dead neutral. Now, in the all-important Kelvin wave generation area, they're still out of the east for the moment. We're going to get into that in a minute. So what have the winds been doing for the past five days? This is just a look at the east-west component of the wind. And we want to see westerly anomalies, the oranges. But let's get ourselves oriented. South America, Central America, Hawaii right there, New Guinea there, the Philippines there, the equator right there, the date line right there. That Kelvin wave generation area thing we were talking about earlier is right here on the equator, just five degrees north and south of the equator, out to about 170 west. So just draw a box in your mind right there. We're looking to see these reds in there. Now, right now we see, this was five days ago on the 3rd of April, see the blues, that's easterly anomalies, but there's like this dividing line right here between easterly anomalies and westerly anomalies. That looks like the active phase of the MJO. We go to the 4th, still holding position, to the 5th, Still holding position to the 6th, oh, maybe making a little progress. The 7th, well, making a little progress, but still, it's like there's a battle going on between the active phase of the MJO, or at least what looks like the active phase of the MJO over the maritime continent, trying to squeeze off to the east, and the inactive phase of the MJO and easterly anomalies and enhanced trades just blowing right into it, the dividing line right there at about 150 east, something like that. So what's the forecast for the next week? All right, so this is the east-west component of the wind over the entire planet. The blues, easterly anomalies, consider that the inactive phase of the MGO. The reds, the active phase, the uh, westerly anomalies. All right, and let's get oriented. Dateline runs right up the middle. Remember, this is the whole planet, so the far... West Pacific starts about 125 east, so right there, okay? And then uh, Ecuador is over at about 80 west, so right about there. So we see, well, let's see, blue, blue, blue. This is all going back the whole way through March. Looks like the inactive phase of the MJO, the last little bit of it holding on the date line today, maybe going to go for one more day. And we see westerly anomalies, just a like what we saw on that previous chart. Westerly anomalies in this dividing line right at 150 east. Now, and these westerly anomalies, pretty strong. They're forecast to seep off to the east, fill the Kelvin wave generation area in a day or two, maybe back off for a second and then come back. And look at this, even stronger, almost reaching to the date line, this looks like a pretty impressive west westerly wind event. So during the last big El Nino, Super El Nino, 2015-16, um, we built this tool. And it's just all it is is the GFS model looking at predicted wind speeds for the Kelvin wave generation area. Now, this is even stricter. It's three north to three south. There's New Guinea right there. The date line is right over here. So this is the far west Pacific. The dotted line here, that's five degrees north, five degrees south. And what is this showing? Well, it's showing 
as of this morning, Sunday morning, actual westerly winds blowing north of New Guinea to a point, look at that, right to that 150 east line. So these aren't anomalies. These are actual winds blowing out of the west and then seeping even to about 155 east. And then look at this. You have easterly, not even easterly anomalies, sorry, easterly trades at, what is that, probably uh, 8 to 10 miles an hour right here in the dividing line, somewhere around 160 east. Now we're going to put this in motion. And this is what's going to get really interesting. Look at this. Westerly anomalies building. Westerly anomalies building while blowing into east, or westerly winds blowing into easterly trades. And there's just like a dividing line between them. And what happens here? Watch this. Maybe what you start seeing a circulation developing here. Okay, and that's a tropical circulation with westerly winds. And this is pretty typical of what happens when you get strong active phases, the MJO, pushing over this area, in uh, uh, interacting with easterly trades, you get a tropical cyclone developing of some kind. At least the model is suggesting we're into Thursday. We're just going to keep going here. And there it goes. And they start building still westerly winds. Also, look at this a little bit down here. Watch this. Let's see if it does it. Here we go. So, wow, look at this. We're on to Saturday. Now, this is a forecast. Don't believe it. Tropical system heading north. Westerly winds. Looks like another tropical system developing right behind that. And then we're into Oh my gosh, look at this. One, two tropical systems. And this is classic, what you call El Nino development, westerly windburst type events, where you get strong west winds. They just blast through here. They hit the east winds. It starts spinning up little spurious cyclones, and you get end up with a cyclone north and south of the Kelvin wave generation area. And this is the sort of thing, boom, boom, look at that. Now, again, it's a model, so I don't want to get too hyped up here. We'll see where we're at next week. But this is the classic sort of El Nino development cycle that you'd want to see. You wouldn't typically see this in April. You'd see this maybe in July or August or September. And this one, the system up here to the north, it'd go up off Japan. Then it'd get, because all this energy is being imparted to the jet stream, it would get caught by the jet stream, carried over, in, if this was maybe September, October, into the Gulf of Alaska and blow up into an extra tropical storm. We're nowhere near that. We're not saying any of that's going to happen. But if this were September, this is exactly what you'd be really keeping your eyes out for. Now, none of these will probably do a whole lot, but the fact that it's even on the charts and it's April, well, it's certainly interesting, if nothing else. All right, so let's go look out two weeks. We're looking, again, still, we're trying to monitor for the active phase of the MJO. This is outgoing long wave radiation, a forecast model going out 15 days, basically two weeks. Uh, this is uh, South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there, Australia, Philippines. Uh, Dateline right there, the equator right there. Kelvin wave generation area right in that area. The blues mean more cloud cover than normal. This is outgoing long wave radiation, sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface. Blues, negative anomalies, meaning more clouds, meaning the active phase of the MJO there, the inactive phase of the MJO in the Indian Ocean. That's today, going out five days, and this is the statistic model, basically no change. Ten days, active phase of the MJO weakening while the inactive phase builds in the Indian Ocean, and then two weeks from now, active phase of the MJO very weak as the inactive phase gets ready to take over the Pacific. Now, the dynamic model, the GEFS model, that same model we were looking at when we were looking at the westerly wind burst and those two cyclones, this is a two-week run of it, and it's an ensemble version suggests the active phase of the MJO, if anything, getting stronger two weeks out and sitting right on the date line. Talk about potential for westerly wind burst, uh, active phase of the MJO creating Kelvin wave. Uh, this is certainly what you'd want to see. The more detailed view, this is the statistic model here, the dynamic model here. These are called phase diagrams. They just show where the active phase is and how strong it is. The MJO, how do you read this? The MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent, that's like Bali, to the West Pacific, 
to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. That's, remember, the MJO, both active and inactive, basically rotate the whole way around the planet. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now. The further it is away from the circle, the stronger it is. So a weak to modest active phase of the MJO over the West Pacific right now. This, the statistic model says, it, the, at moving to... Yeah, the far, we'll say somewhere in the Atlantic and very weak two weeks from now. The dynamic model suggests that the active phase is to build to, well, moderate strength three days from now and then start working its way by the next week into the East Pacific and then into the Atlantic after that and still modestly strong. So both, uh, this, this arm of the statistical model pretty well mirrors what the dynamic model is saying. All right, let's go out one month. All right, this is again, the east-west component of the wind. The blue, easterly anomalies, the inactive phase. The reds, westerly anomalies, or the active phase. In fact, the solid contour is the active phase. The dotted contour is the inactive phase. And let's get ourselves oriented. Dateline running right up the middle, the far west Pacific, 125 east, so right about there, and Ecuador somewhere over around here, 80 west. All right, so we're going back in time, January, inactive phase of the MJO. The very end of January, active phase starts working its way into the Pacific, making it the whole way across the Pacific, the whole way into February, the early part of March. That's what fed all that snow production as, so California's at 120 west, as the active phase. So the active phase in the West Pacific feeds the jet stream. The jet stream starts slamming into California. But when the active phase actually moves south of California, now remember, this is all on the equator, just four degrees north and south of the equator. That's when maximum, uh, typically the maximum weather happens relative to California. So that would have been somewhere in the mid of March. And that, that seems about like what it was. Then we had the inactive phase here and easterly anomalies. The dry out starts. And but look at this. It's only so this is a week. A week from now, inactive phase is supposed to be gone. The active phase pushing solidly to the dateline and then even making it past the dateline the whole way to a point south of California again. Now notice the solid contour doesn't go there, but one can assume that's exactly what's happening. So another and look at the strength of the winds here. These are solid. They're Let's see. Actually, it looks stronger. So the last active phase of the MJO had a little bit of dark reds there and then a little bit here. But this is where you want it in the Kelvin wave generation area. So westerly wind burst looks possible. All right. And let's go out. If a month isn't enough and you don't believe a model going out in a month, well, then we got to go out at least three months because nothing better than a good fairy tale. But the reality is... This model has done an unbelievable job of predicting what's happening. It's been saying exactly the situation we're in. It was talking about that back October of last year when it just seemed like there was just no way that could happen. We were in just the, the worst of the worst of La Nina, and this model is saying, yeah, that's all going to collapse, and things are really going to wake up here, and that's exactly what it's done. All right, so now the past performance is down here. Okay, Dateline runs right up the middle, uh, far west Pacific, right here, 125 east. You can just eyeball what has been and what is forecast. Blue, 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 blue. Other than this one, the yellows are westerly anomalies, the blues easterly anomalies. So westerly wind burst back in February and March. And then here comes our new one right now, working its way across the Kelvin wave generation area. Good, I mean, much more solid westerly anomalies as compared to this last one. And hanging for one, two, three, four, five weeks in the Kelvin wave generation area, you would certainly think that you would get a lot of warm water transported off to the east with that sort of scenario. But no, it backs off a little bit and then reorganizes again, theoretically, in June into the middle of July. All right, so that's our eyeball. Let's overlay the MJO here and see what 
you know, what it's saying. The solid contours, active phase of the MJO. So here's our active phase of the MJO. Now this, I don't know quite why it shows it getting so weak. You know, you'd think it'd just be barreling right on across here, but it's still showing westerly anomalies. And then the inactive phase sets up. But even during the inactive phase, you see easterly anomalies, well, one, one little pocket making it into the Kelvin wave generation area. And late May, but westerly anomalies just totally locked down over the date line. And then here comes the next active phase of the MJO starting oh, early part of June, going the whole way into July and beyond, again with strong westerly anomalies. What is driving all this? Well, we overlay the low-pass filter. This is a El Nino-La Nina bias, if you want to say that. The dotted contour here is a high-pressure bias, the La Nina bias. You can see it was locked over the dateline. It's moving since about March 15th. It's been actually since February 15th. It's been on the move and give it about another... Oh, about April 25th, it'll be completely out of the Kelvin wave generation area and getting weaker by the minute. The low pressure bias here, the El Nino uh, thing uh, uh, bias, which has been locked over the maritime continent for three years on also about February 15th, started moving. Right now, it's at about, well, just eyeballing it, about 165 east and give it about another one, two, two to three weeks, it'll be filling the Kelvin wave generation area and in control. Now, what's that mean? Well, remember this inactive phase of the MJO, and we're going, why are westerly anomalies going on during the inactive phase of the MJO? Because the low pressure bias is trumping, it's taking over and just completely overriding whatever the inactive phase is doing. So El Nino really is like a series of non-stop active phases of the MJO. The effect is the same. It's like a long-running active phase of the MJO that runs for a year or more. This certainly is, and look at the number of conjures, one, two, three, building to four. Again, it's a forecast. Do I believe it? No, but the model's done a really good job, so I'll take it. And all the other models are pretty much on board with this as well. This, for this time of year, to have what's happening in the West Pacific, we've seen that happen, but all, you know, in past El Nino's, really strong ones, but for this time of year to have as much activity as we've had and as much warm water movement off to the East this early in the year, kind of surprising. We're going to get into that in a minute. All right, what's going on down in the ocean? Enough of the MJO, but what are the impacts or the effects? Of, what has the MJO done to the ocean? Not at the surface, but down in the ocean. We've been talking about westerly anomalies and Kelvin waves. Is there any evidence of Kelvin waves in flight or warm water moving from the west to the east? This is data from the TAO buoy array again. This is the west Pacific here, east Pacific here. These little X's is what we're looking at. These are the anchor lines on the TAO buoys. The X's are actual sensors on those anchor line. They detem uh, uh, help determine or, or invest, help us investigate the movement of warm water, not the ocean surface, but down deep in the ocean. This is the 29 degree isotherm, 29 degrees centigrade. That's really warm water. It wasn't even on the charts maybe four or five weeks ago. Now, all of a sudden, it's moving to about 168 east, something like that. The 28-degree isotherm was locked somewhere back in here. Now, it's at 175 west. The 26-degree isotherm was stuck at 140 west, and it was all cold water here for three years it's pushing the whole way into Ecuador with 28 degrees centigrade temperatures building on top of that. But it again, it's not the average temperatures. It's the anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of year. You can see plain as day, warm water, plus three degrees centigrade anomalies. That's like five or six degree water temperatures from the West Pacific, moving from the West the whole way to the east. In fact, here's one Kelvin wave impacting a second Kelvin wave somewhere around, where's that? Uh, says about 132 east. 
pushing off. This is Kelvin wave number two, and there's a third Kelvin wave that was generated from the uh, from the February March active phase of the MJO. They're just, it, it's just overlaid with the second Kelvin wave. It's all just one big river of warm water moving off to the east. Now, why does that matter? Well, as the warm water builds down under the surface in the east, it eventually will be impacting Ecuador and the Galapagos erupting to the surface. In fact, you can see it all here. And then the trades will catch it and it'll start moving off to the east. This is the last little bit of coolish. This is the zero degree line right here. These are slightly cooler waters. This is the last little bit of La Nina here. All but gone. Doesn't even exist. A river flowing off to the east. Here is another model using different technology, using satellite technology, but it shows the same thing. Massively warm waters in the east, a pile of, of warm water building underneath Kelvin wave number one, the leading edge, according to this, is at, I'm sorry, Kelvin wave number two. This is Kelvin wave one here. Kelvin wave number two at about 115 west, so getting very close to Ecuador. And then Kelvin wave number three, at least the best version of it here, already starting to make progress into the West Pacific. And this is the technology used to build that second chart, sea level anomalies. It's just, it's a satellite rotating polar orbit north to south over the planet. As the planet rotates under that, you build a map of the height of the ocean, not the waves. You take out the waves, take out the wind waves, take out the tide, and is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal? Why does that matter? Well, if it's just a couple centimeters higher than normal, that suggests or infers that there's warm water at depth. Warm water expands. When it expands, it displaces water, a little bump above it. Cold water depth contracts, and you'll end up with a little divot on the ocean surface. So let's get ourselves oriented here. Chile, Peru, Central America, Hawaii right there, equator there, dateline there, New Guinea right there, Australia down there. Positive anomalies in a river. And notice, 5 degrees north, 5 degrees south. You go, that little tiny area, that's all we're talking about? And that's going to make all these changes? Yes. And just like the Kelvin wave generation area we talked about, 5 degrees north and south in this area right here, that's where the westerly anomalies are. They blow and look at the resulting river that flows east of it of warm water. It impacts Ecuador. There's a the Galapagos right there. Then starts spreading north and south. And that is the classic river of Kelvin waves that, ty that typically uh, kicks off El Nino. And then finally, the same data, but again, this puts it in time perspective. West Pacific here. East Pacific here. Now notice, this is a year ago, uh, May, April of 2022. Warm, the reds and oranges, warm water in the West Pacific, blues, cold water. Yeah, we had a little Kelvin wave last June. It did nothing. It died. Massive upwelling response. Then back in December of last year, little Kelvin wave, the first little signs of this El Nino thing getting going. And then a second Kelvin wave. And here comes the third one. You see, and I mean, this is a massive, like the dam broke. That, that's the title of one of the videos uh, two weeks ago. The dam has broken. Massive amounts of warm water pushing the whole way across the Pacific. So one, two, three Kelvin waves. And the active phase of the MJO is setting up now. We think a fourth one's coming. Now, of a little concern, over here in the far west Pacific, you see warm water that was building and some of it's starting to get tapped out here. The question is, will more warm water be building in this area? We're not going to go too into depth here, but all right. So the far west Pacific is somewhere oh, right around in here. You see the islands here? But all down in here, all the way back into here, that's not on the chart. And what we think happens is as the active phase of the MJO gets going here, right over like uh, in Indonesia, all this, there's lots, of, this is much shallower water. The sun bakes it. It gets warm. Westerly anomalies blow here. 
and that warm water spills out from here into the Pacific, and we think that that warm water, as we get yet more Kelvin waves going, I'm sorry, more active phases of the MJO, they're going to start tapping a giant reserve of hot water. Remember, this is right on the equator here. It'll start tapping that warm water, backfilling it into this area right here. So because, yes, it's a little concerning that some of this warm water is getting tapped out, but we think there's a whole other batch of it that will backfill fill in behind. But that's something we're going to be monitoring over the next several months. All right, let's go to the surface. See surface temperature anomalies. Difference from normal for this time of year. Real clear sign, well, let's get oriented, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, Hawaii, equator, right there. This is a screaming red flashing light saying massive amounts of warm water are building this area. Also notice, so last week, this sort of this tongue of warm water had collapsed a bit. Now, in the past several days, it's starting to build again. Why is that? Well, we think trades are dying in this area. The inactive phase of the MJO has been in control. It still is in this area, creating some upwelling, but the active phase is coming. And even with that, you can see warm water starting to build out to here. The classic El Nino signal is this bright red going the whole way out to here like that, like a big triangle. We'll show you a little bit more in a second. Sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days. So we actually had some cool water in here. Not cold, but just the temperatures were cooling in this area. Again, we think that was a tribute to the inactive phase of the MJO. But now, just today, warming starting to build. Now, it's already cooking hot here. I don't know that it can really get any hotter. So it, I'm not really concerned that I'm not seeing this all lit, lit, lit up as red. But the fact that this whole area in here is starting to warm again. That's exactly what we want to see. And we expect that this is just going to start getting warmer and warmer over the next several weeks as the active phase makes its way from the west over the east and trades die in this area. The overview picture again, bright red, much warmer than normal temperatures here, but at least two, if not three degrees above normal in this area. And the tongue starting to build. The last little bit of La Nina is these couple of pixels here of blue right there, almost inconsequential. So now you would think, well, the atmosphere is going to take a little bit of time to sense that all this warming is going on here and that instead of it being really cold here where it's been for three years, notice the upwelling off California too here. This is the, the last La Nina remnant signal high pressure still holding in this area while so it's possible to have both el nino signals and la nina signals at the same time we're in transition el nino i'm talking about it sort of been hyping it a little bit um it's not here yet but it's getting its foundation built once it gets its foundation built it's going to take a couple of months for that to happen but as it does it the last fading bits of La Nina will be wiped out, but the whole planet's jet stream pattern will need to be reorganized, and that doesn't happen on a dime. The atmosphere's a big ship takes a couple of months, like three months, to start turning around. So I'm thinking somewhere in the late June, July time frame, maybe even later that, then we'll start seeing much clearer signs of El Nino in the atmosphere in the Pacific Basin. Sea surface temperature trend in the Nino 1.2 area. That would be this area, just like right in here, okay, where it's cooking hot. The Nino 3.4 region is out here, 120 west out to 175, just 5 degrees north and south of the equator. This is the official El Nino monitoring region. You look at that, you go, well, it's a little warm, a little bit cool, sort of a mixed bag still. Again, we're still in that transition. But in the Nino 1.2 region, well, temperatures 2 plus two degrees and 473 thousandths of a degree. So two and a half degrees above normal. Half a degree, if you're in the official El Nino monitoring region, from minus half a degree to plus half a degree is considered neutral. Anything above half a degree is considered El Nino if it's for uh, five consecutive three-month periods. So, but this is not the official El Nino monitoring region. This is, and as expected, temperatures here, uh, 
one hundred and one thousandths of a degree below normal, basically dead neutral. Uh, we need to see these temperatures start building up and we could clearly see, just looking at the satellite data, we're not there yet. So El Nino is not established in the atmosphere, but we certainly are at least dead neutral. And La Nina, the entire un underpinnings of La Nina are gone. So we're going to go back just to do some comparison. Here is the sea surface temperature trend for what I consider to be one of the biggest and best El Ninos, the clearest El Nino I've seen in recent memory. This is 8th of April, 1997. Here, I'll move myself out of the way so you can see it. There you go. April 8th, 97. Uh, basically, yesterday, back in 97. And what was there? A little bit of warming off the Galapagos and a whole bunch of cool water and no clear sign of anything. Now, we're going to compare that to today's image. Look at how much more warming there is here in the East Pacific. And maybe I can go back and forth here. Let's see if I can do this quickly. Okay, there you go. There's one. And here's where we are today. The past, the present. All right, so a big change. Now, let's go one week at a time starting January 1st of this year and just watch or monitor the progression of this. Here we go. We're in January 15th to 22nd. We're into February. A little bit of warming building. This is very much looking like what March of 97 looked like. And then we get deeper into February. We had a little bit of a wind event here coming through the uh, Central American Straits. But notice warming out here off of uh, the Galapagos, early part of March, then and building warming, 19th of March, and then we got a bit of a knockdown of the tongue out here because of the inactive phase of the MJO. But warming continued because Kelvin waves were in flight uh, April 1st, and then here we are and the tongue is redeveloping. It certainly seems like the ocean is biased to just want to build warm water here, build a tongue here, which is the classic El Nino kind of signal. Um, and just for fun, here is the classic El Nino sign uh, signature. This is from the 1st of December of 1997. Talk about a big, well-developed tongue of warm water eastward displaced, right up against Ecuador, not out here in the center of the ocean. When it's right down here, when the warm water is due south of California, that's when you get maximum um, uh, uh, storm impact into the California coast. Maybe not necessarily a good thing when you get into December because it kind of makes for a windy, wet, rainy mess and messes up some of the surf. Um, but if you want maximum El Nino impact, if it's eastward displaced, if the warming is right here up against Ecuador, that's how you get it. We're doing one other thing. We're looking at currents because what one would expect is as this El Nino gets more developed, see the right now the currents kind of blowing out of the east, out of the east, a little bit out of the west. You want to see all this pushing to the east instead of sort of this mixed bag of what it is. Now you go over here off of, uh, well, there's Ecuador right there. You can see west, west, west. I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this on YouTube or not. It's pretty fine. But you see westward current here, westward current in here. This is where the Kelvin waves are really having their biggest impact. But in the far west Pacific, it's still kind of a mixed bag of east and west all mixed together. We'll be monitoring this. This really, there's not a whole lot to see right now, but we'll be monitoring it as we get deeper into this El Nino event. And then finally, looking up and up in the atmosphere, what's the effect of these Kelvin waves building warm water on the atmosphere? We've said, well, we're kind of in transition. We're not really in El Nino yet. The fundamentals of El Nino are building. So we're looking at the Southern Oscillation Index, the difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. Tahiti in the Pacific, Darwin in the Indian Ocean. When pressure is lower in Tahiti, the index goes negative. Well, today it's positive, 21.70. In the past five days or so, it's been positive. But look at this. It's been negative here for almost a month. This is all driven by the active phase of the MJO. And remember saying the inactive phase recently is having an impact. 
uh, on the warm water buildup off of Ecuador and trade winds and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's clearly, clearly showing up here. So, but we know the next active phase of the MJ is building in the West Pacific. This is all going to drop probably negative again here pretty soon. 30 day average. Okay. This takes some of the noise out of it. Right now we're at minus 1.8. Where, where have we been? Well, we were positive 6.65 a month ago. We dropped down, I don't know, oh, let's see, minus 4.13 just a couple of days ago. Now we're bouncing back a little bit because of these positive readings, but at some point this is all going to go negative. And then this is a 30-day uh, retrospective, so it lags 30 days. The 90-day average, 5.07. Where were we a month ago? 12.56. We're definitely heading down. But this is this is really, this is what I consider to be the uh, active-inactive phase of the MJO monitor. This is the El Nino-La Nina monitor. And it's still suggesting, at best, very weak La Nina conditions atmospherically in the Pacific, at least for the moment. But I think that's going to be pretty short-lived. All right, this picture shows, really tells the story quite well. The 30-day uh, mo moving SOI graphed out. Going back January 2021, the downward spikes are the active phase of the MJO, the upward spikes are the act inactive phase. You can see the trend clearly upward, suggesting the inactive phases of the MJO were stronger than the active phases. We peaked out here July 2022 into October and then starting January 2023, it's just been a almost steady, precipitous drop into negative territory. Um, this is exactly where we want to be. But notice, we were up at plus 20. We want to be down here at minus 15 or minus 20. Again, we're still basically in new. There's zero. Suge this suggests we're in neutral territory, neither El Nino nor La Nina, but the fundamentals are building. We expect this to continue to just plummet. And then finally, the sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino monitoring region. Today, April, we're at neutral, neither positive nor negative. The forecast as we get into July, now this is the raw data, so it's a little bit overhyped, plus 1.4 degrees in July. I mean, that's an El Nino in and of itself, going up to 2.2 degrees, almost 2.25. That's super El Nino territory by November. Now, this is the raw data. The... Uh, more muted uh, conservative data, the PDF corrected suggests, well, temperature's still going to 1.05 degrees in July and then up to 1.75 degrees in November. Still clearly El Nino territory, maybe not super El Nino. I think somewhere around two is super El Nino, but we'll see. I have a feeling this might be biased a little bit on the cool side. And this is the graphic for sea surface temperatures in September of 2023. There's South America, Central America, um, New Guinea there, the equator there, dateline there. Clearly a very well-defined, oh, and look at this, these grays. These are two degree plus anomalies out here in this region. So clearly a well-defined El Nino signature according to this model, and it's going out into September, but certainly something to monitor. So for right now, not a whole lot of surf forecast. A little bit of northern swell impacting north and central California. That'll go for a day or so. Then it looks like a northwest wind event for California, and things just get chopped up. A little bit of southern hemi swell for southern California for Monday, Tuesday, maybe into Wednesday. Hawaii kind of out of it, not a little bit of sideband swell, perhaps a little bit of north wind swell coming into the islands. I think it was about midweek. But surf-wise, nothing too over the top. Uh, we're basically just waiting for this El Nino, La Nina thing to settle out, the jet stream to get reconfigured, or at least the Southern Hemi to start waking up. Should be happening any day now, but we didn't even show it. I looked at the forecast. There's really nothing forecast down south yet, but 
If there is, we'll let you know. Looking longer term, though, things just on track. Massive amount of warm water moving into the east equatorial Pacific. Uh, three different Kelvin waves in flight. Another active phase of the MJO setting up. It seems like El Nino is all but a done deal. Don't want to say that too loud on this El Nino. Looking to be at least getting traction earlier than any other El Nino that we've seen in in any record, you know, since I've been alive, 82, 83 was the, the first Super El Nino. The next one after that was 97. Then there was another one in 2015, and now yet another after that. It seems like the number and frequency of Super El Ninos is getting more consistent. That would not be surprising given that uh, other data we saw at Indian provide the graphics suggests that the atmosphere or the global ocean temperatures, not just in the El Nino regions, but just all the planet's oceans, are much warmer now than they've ever been in uh, at least in reasonable record. Um, it's not surprising that you would get stronger El Ninos because El Ninos are a way for the planet to vent heat out of the oceans up into the atmosphere and try to cool things down a little bit. Uh, it seems like it's sort of a losing battle, but the atmosphere is trying to cool things down as best it can. We can get something good out of that. At least we'll get some surf and we'll get some rain. In between, though, that's the issues. We just came out of a long La Nina, dry, three-year La Nina, really dry. We suspect that after this El Nino, we'll be right back in the same place, but we're not going to dwell on that at the moment. Let's focus on the task at hand. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed the video. That's it for this week. Like, subscribe, ring the bell. If you have comments, write them up. If you want to donate, that's okay, too. We're trying to get that new server. And that's it for this week. We will do it next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.